Fabiola here from Germany and you are watching Teacher Learning Gas with Piri Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Episode number 13. Today is June 2nd, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart calling from beautiful Aguascalientes, Mexico. Morning, everybody. This is Piri Herrera enjoying the heat wave here in, in town and uh, very glad that the plane in the cameras only take me from the waist above. So we're in shorts and sandals for you all today. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been a hot one, definitely. Um, right. We, um, Today, uh, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, we have a, a Facebook uh, website if you want to reach out and post questions and uh, feel free to leave us comments. And uh, you can reach me also at my webpage at benjaminlstewart.com.wordpress.com and Petey's website is homers2000.wixsite.com forward slash PDHA. Yes, you can also reach us through the fan page, Teacher Learning Cast Facebook and Google, uh, Teacher Learning Cast Benjamin Stewart or Teacher Learning Cast Piri Herrera. And you can reach all of the ways to get in touch with us and um, uh, talk a little bit, share about these experiences in learning and teaching that we've been trying to, to bring up uh, as uh, and a starting point for uh, reflection and uh, analysis of different opinions. And, and glad that we already had guests here at, at the transmission last week. We were discussing with Adriana Macias Torres about the teaching aids exhibition she held uh, last week also. And uh, we also had students from the BA and ELT. We, we had our first guest, Ken Bauer, uh discussing flip learning in different chapters. So you can look for us there. And, um, and we were trying to discuss topics that we think are topics that are kind of interesting for everybody, but our, my, our idea is for you who are joining this transmission live or on demand, uh, leave us comments and tell us what you wanna discuss about us. If you wanna join the, the transmission, if you wanna put something on the table, if you agree or disagree with whatever we, we go through here, we can have an analysis, we can invite people and we are open to this sharing, right man? Absolutely. Um, so really, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we, we've had some great talks. And uh, again, if there's some topics that you want us to talk about, uh, whether you want to be part of the conversation or not, feel free to, to leave us the, that advice, that feedback. It really does matter. We would uh, greatly appreciate hearing from you. And uh, especially today's topic, uh, there's some things that I want to talk about with regard to competency-based education. I have some personal opinions. Um, Pity's going to be talking about uh, certain learning strategies, and I, I may hit, we both, I'm sure, have very strong opinions about that. So again, feel free to uh, join in and, and leave comments, even if you disagree with us. Uh, it's all it's all good. Uh, yes, so, Ben. Something we've been doing very quickly in the last times is the announcements of different events that we have, and uh, we we've been having a lot of action in different places and. And uh, the more we can know from you, uh, where you're from and where you're watching from, and uh, we can also start looking for other places. But here in town, we had different events. We just had the uh, Teaching AIDS exhibition here at the Universidad Autónoma de Huascalientes by the students of the BA in English Language Teaching, the, the fourth semester. And we also had the Teaching AIDS ex exhibition from students from the French and, uh, and the Spanish uh, uh, language teaching as uh, uh, languages as foreign language. Uh, how do you structure all this thing? It's uh, uh, teaching French and Spanish as foreign languages. That's it. And I've been struggling with that all, all the time. And 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 we try to cover the events. They also held their, their teaching ex exhibition. And but we are also uh, having some other events. Uh, ben, uh, you recently attended to UPTC. Can you tell us about that a bit? Yeah, no, it was a great, a great event. Um, it was an event that they uh, started up again. I think they had taken four years off, and uh, so 
they had prior to that many years of having this conference and had the pleasure of attending and presenting uh, in the past. Uh, I was invited this year and it was a lovely event, it really was uh, educational. It was great to see a lot of different uh, students and, and in-service teachers uh, both in the event and uh, a lot of ex-students, now colleagues, uh, a lot of uh, teachers that I haven't seen in a long while. It was very nice to see those uh, those people and meet some new friends and uh, colleagues. So uh, it was it was great. In fact, we're, I'm hoping that uh, we can get uh, a few of the organizers of that event uh, in maybe next week uh, to discuss uh, so the, the event and get their perspective. Uh, but it was really a great event, and I think those types of events are exactly what we need here locally. It's uh, really about taking advantage of all the different learning opportunities that we have as English language teachers here in Aguas Calientes and uh, really uh, promoting those so that we all uh, learn, kind of expanding our learning community outside uh, the four walls of our own respective institutions. So it was a really great event, learned a lot, and um, uh, hopefully it's something that they can continue in the future and it's, hopefully it's something that uh, they can bring in some insights and uh, hopefully next week. Yes, I was really glad to hear that event was packed up with people and uh, they didn't have more room for anybody else early, very early in the in the uh, booking up for the for the event. When I tried to do it, I didn't have any space and I and I tried to do it uh, kind of early and, and, and but I'm glad that people in town and students and teachers from different universities are joining these kinds of events. We also had an event in the Escuela Normal Superior Federal de Huascalientes, which was an exhibition from freshmen for, from, for the BA, uh, showing up a little bit about different cultures and countries. And now that you mentioned about the, the former students from our BA here in the Autonoma and, and now colleagues, uh, teachers in service and, and, and teachers that are already experienced teachers and teachers with different kind of preparations after our BA, have different kind of studies and, and, and and seminars and, and, and diplomas and all this. Uh, we also have an event from former students at UTR, Universidad Tecnológica El Retoño, which is going to be, uh, I guess it's also a teaching aids exhibition event, which is going to be June 29th. Um, we don't have time yet, but as soon as we get more information, we're going to share it with you. And I know there's also another event in Escuela Normal Federal Superior de Aguascalientes, uh, but uh, we haven't really gotten the, the details about it, but I guess it's going to be around the same day, uh, if not the same day, around the same day. And, uh, and I think we, we, we would like everybody to start sharing your events, uh, whether big or small, uh, any event in which you are willing to have uh, an, an open door for anybody who wants to tag along. Tag along. Yeah, and uh, also I would like to mention uh, the Mexico. Uh, 45th uh, International Convention as well. Um, that's going to be October 25th through the 28th. It's going to be in Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco. And also NUPI, uh, the 16th International Conference for English Teachers. Uh, and uh, that's titled Internationalization and Digital Learning Perspectives and Challenges in ELT. That's going to be in October 18th through the 21st uh, in Hualtuco. So yeah, with a lot of great events here, not only locally in Aguascalientes, but throughout Mexico. So again, let us know if you have an, a particular event. And if you want us to promote that, of course, let us know. If you want to come on and discuss it more uh, specifically, that's great too. That's also an option. So it's really about promotion and uh, again, trying to expand the, the learning opportunities here. Okay. So uh, I hope you, you guys have more things to share with us and, and, and share it soon, please. Uh, today, what we're going to do today, Ben, we have a couple of topics, uh, topics you already mentioned uh, about uh, uh, competency-based education. Absolutely. Uh, I want to start uh, by saying first that, um, you know, the opinions, and we haven't really talked much about this, but I, I think it's something that both, uh, both of us really, uh, agree on. Uh, but it's important to mention that all the opinions that we have are ours alone, right? So we're not representing any any other uh, institution or as far as our ideas go. These are all individual ideas. And uh, some of the things that I want to talk about today with regard to competency-based education, um, you know, perhaps others will disagree, um, and that's great. 
but uh, it's important to state that everything that we say and mention and discuss in this show is our, our own our own ideas. And when I started looking up this idea of competency-based education, I, I've always kind of been on on the fence, uh, especially in the United States. We, there's a lot of talk about about it, and uh, it's very closely linked to standards-based education, which is kind of it's related, but another another topic for another day. But I I wanted to start first uh, by the, referencing this book and discussing first uh, really the basic premise of a, a competency-based education or a CBE. Um, this book talks about how students need to demonstrate mastery. Okay, so really one of the main uh, ideas of CBE is this I idea of students mastering uh, proficiency levels. Um, they say that it's, it's sometimes called proficiency and competency. So there's a mix of words to or terms that are used that mean similar things, what, that basically mean the same thing. So I think this also adds to possible uh, confusion in really what is a competency-based uh, education. Um, the, this particular book talks about uh, a more expanded version where students also advance on demonstrated mastery. Competencies include explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives. Uh, they talk about the importance of assessment being meaningful and a positive learning experience for, for the students. Uh, they talk about the importance of differentiated education, so being able to differentiate and uh, the support that students receive. And they also talk about a learning outcomes, emphasizing uh, competencies th that include the application and creation of knowledge. Okay, so it's not just using the knowledge, but it's actually applying it in new situations and the creation of, uh, of, of knowledge as being kind of an element uh, several elements of uh, personalized uh, competency-based education. Now, this particular book, they, they throw in this idea of personalized education, and really for today's discussion, I want to stay focused more on just competency-based um, because, again, personalized education is another topic that we can perhaps talk about uh, on another day. Uh, but this book also talks about the Gates Foundation and how they add to this idea of competency-based education by looking at learner profiles, looking at how to define and implement personal learning paths, and also looking at flexible learning environments. So they, they throw in competency-based in with these other three elements, learning profiles, personal learning paths, and f flexible learning environments. Mm. And, you know, the the context that we mainly limit our discussions on are really formal educational context. That is, situations where students are signing up for a course in an institution where there's typically a set time to complete a, cert a set, uh, set of uh, objectives. And so I think that the challenge of a competency-based education uh, is trying to find, well, how do you base the learning experience on uh, this idea of mastery and proficiency level? And if the idea is that students can progress to the next level when they're proficient, when they've reached mastery, regardless of, of time, uh, I, there's some limitations, right, that I, that I see in, in that respect. Uh, there's one last thing I want to share here, and this was a, a definition by the Foundation for Excellence in Education. And they define CBE as a system of instruction where students advance to higher levels of learning when they demonstrate mastery of concepts and skills regardless of time, place, and pace. Right. So that. time, place, and pace. So for me, this has big implications here when we look at, well, how, what does this actually mean? when we compare this to the traditional system where time is constant and learning is variable to a CBE situation where learning is constant and time is variable. It's almost switching it around completely, this idea, you know, and I think in the truest sense of competency-based education, PD, it's like 
whenever a student reaches a certain mastery level, they should be able to go to the next level, and that should include another grade level or another course if we're talking about within a curriculum. And I think we can see automatically the challenges that, that we're going to face, especially as English language teachers. I'm thinking about, you know, the teaching of English, right? And, and what does this mean to implement a competency-based education when time, place, and pace really are turned on its head, so to speak, right? They're co completely different, you know? So I don't know, Pity, in your case, what, I mean, how would you look at this? And especially from a, a teacher, an English teacher perspective, and maybe a teacher training perspective, like it's one thing to teach the objectives of the class, but then it's another to say, okay, when I have a differentiated classroom or a mixed abilities classroom where some students are really far advanced, others are uh, have a lower level, which is the normal, it would, you know, which is the norm. Everyone, I think, uh, can uh, relate to having a mixed abilities classroom, but how do we actually implement this competency-based education within those types of contexts? It, it's something kind of uh, difficult to, uh, to fit into the system, mainly because of what you just said about the classes are established at a certain time, and also in specific contexts, and uh, we are trying to align courses vertical and horizontal and uh and we are trying to structure something in in which i don't know if it's fair to put it in that word but i think we're, we're trying to establish something in which there's always control there's everything it's on control according to lines according to systems according to electronic systems according to policies and that's kind of difficult to fit and i understand what you mean by uh, uh this differentiated instruct instructions which has been a discussion for long uh but for example here in in, in teachers information it's uh, difficult to uh carry on in the classes we had for uh students teaching practice and mm, and mainly at, at, the, at the early stages, understand that, yes, we're going to have students who come with a mastery of the minimum requiring according to the policies or, or, the, or the establishment of the course. And then you have to work with them about a different level from what it's is stated in the program. And we have other students with, which have not uh, faced teaching at, at any time in their lives and they have to start from zero and get to a minimum standard required. And talking about the standards and talking about these kind of objectives, we are uh, totally going against this time, place, and pace uh, flexibility for them. So yeah, it's a, it's a hard thing to fit. And, it's, and more than to fit into the system, if there's a way you can manage, uh, like, uh, like uh, I think, uh, the model of uh, what, I, what, what I'll try to talk about later, if we have time, because I see what you, we are discussing here is going to take long. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you have certain models, you can do some try-ups and you can try to make these adaptations to fit the education to a special pace and needs of each student. But how the, the, the struggling in there is not to be carried away uh, and, and also, you have to fulfill the requirements of the institution, uh, of, the pro, of the syllabus you're following, the career, the objectives, and we have to this, manage this double play. I don't know if I make myself clear in that part, Ben. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I look at it as two, from two perspectives. It's like I can see implementing it course to course, maybe at the school level. So if an institution is saying, okay, we're implementing this, uh, CBE or this, uh, you know, proficiency-based type of education where students, if they show mastery of skills and knowledge of in a certain area, then they can automatically go to another course, right? But another class or another level. This would be, again, at the institutional level. The other situation or the other side of it is probably more within our context and more realistic is 
probably at the course level or, or at the group level, the teacher educator needs to figure out how to uh, promote this mastery, but within the context and the confines, really, and the limitations of a uh, formal education. That is, you've got you know 16 weeks, for example, or you've got a, a certain set of curricula or curricular elements that you need to adhere to, and then work work within the parameters of that of that situation. I think that um, you know the, there's a lot of things that people talk about with regard to CBE that I think are valid and important, like differentiated instruction, and and it, you know I'm showing this article here uh, where they're also talking. The, about the terms that we even use to describe it. They say competency-based education, also known as proficiency-based, mastery-based, and performance-based. So, you know, it depends on what word you're even using. Uh, you know, for me, performance-based education kind of uh, rings true because we've talked a lot about performance tasks, and, and then we can, you know, we talked about that in depth. And if that's the same thing as competency-based, okay, that, that's, that has some meaning for me personally. But this idea of competency-based where time, place, and pace really are thrown out the window, so to speak, I mean, in the sense that time, okay, whatever time it takes to be able to reach to the next level, okay, you can learn from wherever you want, okay, that's great with mobile technologies, and, and that's, I, I get that. And then the pace, everybody, you know, in the true sense, every student would go at his or her own pace. So again, that, that, that's going to that's gonna be a problem when, and when we're talking about formal education. Um, I think it's one thing to be flexible in the pace within maybe a given course, perhaps. I mean, it's going to depend on the situation uh, where some students are going to achieve the, the objectives, the course objectives before others. Um, I, I think that's a, a, an important consideration that all teachers, both in-service and pre-service teachers, need to look at is, you know, what happens when some students are going to uh, achieve those some goals before others? You know, what are we going to do to keep them uh, engaged and keep them uh, and, and give them opportunities maybe to learn more and go above and beyond maybe the, the expectations of the course for, for those students while providing support for those students who have yet to meet uh, the course objectives. All right. So I think that question, that, prop, that problem or challenge that we're going to have, I think is a real, situ a real problem that we need to address. And if it's within the conversation of competency-based education, great, right? I mean, I think that's, that's, that's fine. But I think for me, that's the central issue is how do we deal with the mixed abilities classroom and achieving those core goals. Yes, Ben, I you I think you touch a very important thing in there, uh, mentioning the the this the the so-called flexibility, uh, which is limited. It's utterly limited, and it's just a variation in the. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a slight degree of flexibility on. Uh, on what the students can do, when can they do it within a very uh, short period of time and not really, um, I mean, at the end, whatever happens, whether fast or, or slow, they have only the 16 weeks. In, the, in this case, for example, or in other institutions, they have uh, uh, what they call uh, quarters and, and they have a, a shorter gap to to achieve whatever it's expected from them to achieve. And so flexibility, it's, it's extremely limited in, in that sense. And uh, the other part of this would be the follow-up. Uh, if, if, really, if you really are flexible within the limits and the students are passing from one course to another and, and there are things they have to to still develop uh, uh, certain aspects that are, are not uh, master or or, or 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 in 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 the total of, of their development, uh, different aspects come to my mind, like the 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 sequence in in from one course to another, the relationship from one type of course to another, and beyond that, the follow up that one teacher can have from one teacher to another. 
uh, because right now I my guess would be, and I'm and this is just uh, my my view and my opinion without any kind of research or, or really uh, deep thought about this. But my guess would be that the main decision from the teacher comes from the syllabus, not from whatever the students bring from the previous semester. And, and, uh, and it's not the same. And we are taking it as the same because you already took that course or you already went through that syllabus. It's supposed that you can handle this or uh, I take for granted that you already know that or things like those. I think uh, I'm just grasping some kind of... Uh, uh, scratching some some surface and, and, and examples which may be really really deep things to analyze to analyze yeah that, that's a good point i because yeah students may master something in one course which will prepare them to do well in the next course but then your question you're addressing really an important issue of linking and actually scaffolding even what they learned in the prior course with what and expanding on that to to this course and then the present course and then finding out you know how competencies are going to be kind of interlinked in those but but i i see i that's i see your point that you know we could easily say well they master a certain skill or knowledge in one class and then it being possibly ignored in another class later on or at least opportunities aren't present to expand, uh, help students expand that knowledge from one course to the next. So um, I, I'm sharing here with you because I wanted to kind of show a different perspective of competencies that I'm not sure how uh, much of the, the pace, place, and pace issue or challenges that we just talked about fall into because it, this is example, I know this is in Spanish, um, the but the the idea here that when i look at this i'm starting to think more in terms of standards okay and i personally don't have a problem with standards or listing out competencies this way um in that it it kind of addresses it helps us kind of list certain things that that we need to to focus on um i think the challenge is going to be making sure that the competencies or the standards are not either too general nor too specific. They're not too abstract nor too concrete, depending on you know the course for that particular uh, you know competency. I think that the trick is to find the key competencies that that fall within that balance between not being too general, too specific, and then across the curriculum being able to implement those competencies in some sort of you know by recycling perhaps right in a way that at the curriculum level the competencies are really represented or the standards right are represented that i don't have a problem with necessarily right it, it goes it doesn't talk much about the idea of flexible learning or pace right it's just kind of you know you need to stick to these types of competencies and you know i think that it really is in, an interesting way of looking at uh, CPE really is, okay, from what side are we looking at? You know, because I, I feel that these are two different ways of, of looking at it that may or may not come together at the end of the day. I'm not sure. I mean, again, I, uh, we, we have uh, standards that we deal with, um, but there are not at the institutional level, to my knowledge, competencies that are listed out in this way. So I'm, I'm not speaking from experience in that regard. In that sense, we would really like to hear from anyone who's implementing competencies, especially in the English language learning classroom. Um, again, if you're on Facebook, leave us a, a comment about your experiences uh, and, and positive or negative, how things are, are working. Uh, because I really would like to get some insight about teachers out in the field using this and and you and seeing how they they work with this idea of competencies, whether it's listed out as kind of a standard or this idea of even more flexible learning environments where pace, place, and pace uh, are really part of uh, the learning experience. The last thing I want to say here with regard to standards is the or competencies again i'm kind of using both terms interchangeably now 
the standards for foreign language learning, the five C's, okay, this has been around for a long time. And I thought about the five C's here in terms of actually competencies, really, again, putting aside the idea of uh, the flexible learning, which, again, I'm not saying that it's not important. Of course, we need to have this flexible learning. But if we're going to the level of students can progress and go to another um, another type of activity at their own, uh, you know, at their own time, then, yeah, there's going to be some limitations. But I think that I think it's worth sharing that these, these standards, which, again, have been a long, around for a long time, I think this is something useful that most of us can use in our English language learning classroom, that if we're just referencing these throughout a semester, for example, and we're trying to hit, if not all, most of these standards, I think we're on the right track. And I think in that sense, if we're going to call these competencies or standards, I think standards ha does have a place. Uh, PD, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, what, what I see is that uh, we have kind of guidelines in there a little bit, but uh, at the same time, talking about, again, the flexibility and the individuality for the competencies, but the guidelines uh, have also to vary according to, to students themselves. And, and, and yes, it has to be, I think we've discussed this idea of a wider view uh, from a different perspective and a different topic, but, but it's pretty much, it pretty much goes to the same. A wider view of what students will do in the future with the language. Are, are, so it, so it, it means that the teacher has to have in mind also a wider view of the curriculum itself, uh, whatever the students are going to study around. And uh, I, I was uh, catching up some of the uh, uh, articles you, you, you have the link for for this topic. And, and, uh, and yes, it mentions about the, the necessity for, for these models in competency to have a, a, a different opportunities and different kind of models for students so they can uh, at least have a wider variety of guides from which they can start to, to look for their own path and get to develop uh, all this competency they are required for. Uh, and, and finally, I, I, I mean, on all these uh, small details, as general comments, but at the same time, I consider one of the course I, I catch in, in the readings uh, two main aspects that they mentioned. Uh, well, one of the authors uh, mentioned the competency-based pacing and the second element being the competency-specific feedback. So we would go again to the idea of having this um, direct uh, individual relationship and connection with the students and, uh, and but at the same time, as the teachers or the tutors, we have to have all this background of um, our our profession, all this background about the the theories behind learning teaching, the uh, whatever that may help the students, not only the theories but the experience and the practical things that may help our students, just as a sample and keep on learning and keep on developing things so we can bring this multiple models and multiple opportunities for the students to take their own path. And, 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 uh, and I think this, this aspect of competency-specific feedback goes through the idea of the reflection at every moment during the development. So, uh, and again, all, everything, since we are talking about uh, individual paths, Everything we can mention and everything we can read about, it's going to be also just a general guide that has to be readapted. This uh, forces that you mentioned also, there are uh, general aspects that can be uh, uh, on a starting point and, and they are broad topics. And precisely, I think that's why maybe that's why they're both, because then the students from there uh, can take their own path. Because again, if we have a framework, a specific single framework for it, then again, we are not really developing this, uh, this uh, idea of flexibility. Yeah, I think in a future broadcast, I want, I'm making a note to myself that to revisit this idea of learning path, because I think that 
I have a lot of opinions about that. I, I think that's something that uh, is worth diving into a little bit deeply. And really the purpose of today's discussion was just kind of to open up this idea of competency-based and uh, education and uh, again, expand on it in other broadcasts later on. But I think I'll conclude by basically saying that, you know, for me personally, a performance-based uh, education is pretty much in line with most of the concepts here with this idea of competency-based, with the exception of maybe listing out the very, very specific uh, kind of standards or competencies. But I think that it's um, worth considering and looking into and um, and reflecting on, and especially in terms of your own practice. Um, but moving on to uh, the next segment, Petey, because I think your topic is really important and necessary, really looking at different learning styles and how those kind of cycle through. So can you kind of present and give us some ideas about, uh, about that? Right, just a little bit before, I would like to invite everybody to join us through our different media. And, uh, and and visit our personal web pages. You can reach us through different uh, paths. If you, the easiest way to do it is to Google it. If you Google Teacher Learning Cast Benjamin Stewart or Teacher Learning Cast Piri Herrera, you can reach all of the different media we have for you. We have the Facebook fan page, Teacher Learning Cast, if you look for us in, in, in Facebook. And for the guys that follow the live transmission, I know some people is even watching the video afterwards. Remember, this is a secondary transmission. It's a different uh, environment and a different feeling maybe in the sound also uh, from the original transmission. So click the link above if you want to have a better view, better sound. And, and, and it, indeed, it's, it, I've, I've been through the videos and it's kind of a different feeling if you go through the original transmission because then you can have Benjamin in first plane and our guests also in first plane and a better sound quality. Uh, so please. Uh, keep on uh, keeping in touch with us and send us your comment. Tell us what you want to hear about. Tell us your opinion about whatever you you watch in the live transmission or in the in the previous uh, episodes, the on-demand videos. Right. So uh, we are hoping that uh, little by little you join because I'm really glad for the people that joins the, the the Facebook live transmission. And, and, and now uh, take that second step and, and write something for us and see what you think about it. Uh, yes, Ben, the, the topic I, I wanted to bring today, it's also something quite uh, broad in general. It's, uh, it's a model that um, uh, somehow, uh, it, I, I think, I think uh, different people here in Mexico uh, goes over this model. And, and I dare to say that because it's a model that, uh, influence it has a big influence and impact in the national program of education it's one of the core aspects in the in the back in theoretical background and methodology follow that started in all these uh educational changes that we've been having since uh, if i well recall and please if anybody knows let, let me know if i'm right about this but since 2006 uh, they implemented uh, changes in the language teaching programs at the national level, and they brought up precisely this idea of experiential learning theory by David Colts, and uh, and and language teaching itself goes uh, with the idea of having a students going through this path of the experiential learning. Beyond that, uh, in in my case, I also decided to to have uh, this is something that we do here in teacher formation, and I also decided to to somehow um, take it as part of the of the theoretical background that I manage with my students, uh, in, and, and I don't I don't uh, actually manage it for language teaching. I use it when we talk about obser classroom observation, when we talk about teaching practicum, when we talk about going to real classes and have uh, experiences in which they are developing uh, their, their abilities, their knowledge, and their attitudes, their characters as teachers. And, uh, and this is kind of a model. And, and I think somehow it matches also the idea of, uh, of the competences uh, uh, aspect. And, and uh, let me see if I can get to one of the, the things that I'm having problems with my connection right here. And I cannot see. You want me to pull it up? 
Oh, oh, it's already charging now. I got it. I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen. Um, yeah, because he wasn't charging the page, but I have it in here. I don't know. If you can look at my my yeah. screen right there in the yeah. I see. Uh, for people in Facebook, I I know you can see this very well, but you can go to the original transmission and there you can have the better view. Uh, sorry, uh, I just clicked wrong. Here it is. Uh, pretty much this is the idea of experiential learning. It's, it's a four stage situation in which the students go through a concrete experience, uh, whatever it is, whatever, whichever topic they, they're discussing, or, or uh, in this case, language teaching is the experience with the language, doing something actually with the language and having the contact with the language. In the case of teaching formation, we would be discussing about the idea of actually, let's put a, a case in point, a classroom observation. The actual fact of going to a classroom, asking the teacher for permission to observe, get into the classroom and collect the data. Uh, that would be the concrete experience idea. Uh, with uh, with the second stage would be the reflective observation, uh, which is going backwards and, and reviewing whatever we can actually uh, reflect on about that concrete experience and start uh, grasping the importance and, and, and the, the specifics of the experience we just had. Then through the third stage, which would be the abstract conceptualization, uh, and which is uh, uh, the moment in which all this reflection and all this grasping about whatever happened and all this uh, formula of what I saw, what I think, what I would do, what would have been the, a different path to follow, uh, what can I, what I consider the best thing of it, what I consider the things that needs a little bit more of work and think, and 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 after all this thinking and all this reflection having an abstract conceptualization of it. Uh, and, and it's again based on reflection, right? Yeah, uh, rising, uh, stating in concrete. I, I would say it's, I would take it like the closing of the reflection in that sense, having some conclusions, having, having some um, ideas supported by, uh, by whatever you experience at the moment of having the concrete experience, right? and analyze through the reflective observation uh, and capitalize, like uh, concluded in the abstract conceptualization. In order to get to the fourth stage, which is the active experimentation. Um, the idea there that they actually consider whatever they conceptualize, consider the outcomes of that reflective observation after having the experience and being ready to uh, do it again. Having again, uh, doing a uh, uh, daring to uh, make the slight changes, or maybe there are not changes. May are, maybe there are things that weren't done before, and starting to to work with it. So, uh, if I'm, I'm trying to talk kind of general, because I, I would like it to fit to any of the areas you are teaching right now, or the the viewers are teaching right now. But uh, but in fact, it's it's a, a four stages idea in which uh, reflection, I would say, is the key word. Analysis, reflection, and in this case putting in there the, the figure of the tutor, of the teacher, I would say uh, feedback. Uh, feedback, but not only from the tutor, also the feedback itself when the active experimentation comes. Something that uh, I think, Ben, I, 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 you, you tend to talk a lot. What kind of feedback? When we talk about teaching practicum and some discussions we have had, I, I, I kind of uh, hear your words when, when you say... Um, uh, explicitly on under hidden, what kind of feedback is the teacher having from the students? What are they sensing? What are they per per perceiving at the moment of performances in order to uh, make decisions? And uh, if, you, if you see it that way, it's again, it's all this experience, but in, in seconds when you take in progress decision in the classrooms, but uh, before going beyond, I don't know, Ben, if you have any uh, appreciation or any, any Comment about this uh, idea of experiential uh, stages? Yeah, so this is interesting, and I keep thinking, and I, I put, uh, go ahead and leave your slide up there if you would, where, where you are, just so we can look at this diagram. And But I keep thinking about our conversations with our pre-service teachers that we had a couple of weeks ago, 
and yeah, talking about reflection and, and tutoring uh, the, the the relationship really between you, the tutor, and the pre-service teachers with regard to reflection. And you know, I've I've looked at this this uh, diagram, this experiential learning cycle, many times and thought about it a lot. And, and I still I find that I know that this is kind of listed as a cycle, like one leads to another, leads to another. But I think that it's more complex than than this image represents. I think that it is so complex in this that reflection, for example, reflection observation can be part of the concrete experience at the same time. If we want to look at, you know, reflecting in action, we talked a little bit about this with the, the, the student teachers that, you know, how much did you realize at the moment that you were teaching the class and, and kind of having the students have this reflection in action right in the moment uh, of that experience instead of just first the concrete experience and then later uh, the reflective experience, which of course happens too, but I don't think that's the only way that it happens. And to take another example, um, the planning, looking at the active experimentation versus the reflective observation, you know, when someone's planning on something that they have concluded from, let's say, the abstract conceptualization, they are going to reflect on what they reflected on. They're going to reflect on what they thought about at the time when they were thinking about the concrete experience, right? So it almost, all of these in different ways for me come together as, as a possible one experience uh, and not necessarily a cycle, a learning cycle. And that would be my first comment. And then the second comment I would say is this idea of styles, like, I don't know if it's a style per se for a learner, like a learning style, because I don't really look at it as learning style. I look at it more as uh, a function or, or just a reality of just different ways of, of thinking, right? So, um, you know, the concrete experience for me would be more the, uh, the procedural knowledge versus abstract conceptualization would be more... Uh, the, right, man. Yeah. Right. I, I, I agree with you with what you're saying in in, uh, in, in the sense of the uh, of the interrelation uh, amongst the, the stages which are not really stages and yeah that's why my comment was like every time you go through one stage you can uh, refer to any other of these stages at the same time and uh, as you mentioned in I, I, I agree I totally agree in the fact that in every single one of these stages you can retake another, uh, uh, inside that stage in order to achieve, let's say, the uh, the abstract contextual contextualization, you may go through any of the other or all of the other stages again, back and forth, in order to to concrete the idea. I'm, and, and I think this is pretty much uh, what Cope's intended because, uh, yeah, it's presented in the sense of a cycle, but and, and uh, going further to the styles, and, and that this was, will also answer a little bit your concern about the, the styles thing. Uh, this is just the, the presentation of the idea of the experiential learning, right? But further on, he's got, uh, I don't know if it's in this slide. Oh, you see, bro, well, this is another diagram. Yeah. And, and there's, okay, you see, there's a little bit of uh, the idea of the interrelation amongst the different stages and a little bit more of the specifics about uh, uh, the, 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 I think it's talking about the um, students' uh, performance or, or students, uh, what, what would you say? Like it's, it's talking about the feeling, the thinking, the watching, the doing. And, and that's why pretty much, I think the National Program of Education also took this, this idea of experiential learning. In fact, they are focusing their lesson plans for for primary school on doing with the language, being the, with the language, and, uh, and and one more, uh, which I, I, I can uh, or not recall right now, but it goes pretty much with the idea, this idea. Now, yeah, this, I just think yeah. that, you know, for example, having feeling on one side of the continuum and thinking on the other is just, for me, it's misleading. Because right, I think right. we can think, and, I mean, not always, I'm yeah. saying, you know, but I think it's possible, this diagram for me does not show the idea of mixing thinking with feeling, 
right? You're feeling something in the experience. And again, I, I don't know how much feeling is in the concrete experience, to be honest. I mean, I'm thinking of, it, it, it's going to depend. Like, for example, if I'm a pre-service teacher I don't, I, and I don't have a lot of experience and I'm in the moment of teaching my first class with new students, I'm in a concrete experience, okay, by definition. But I am thinking like crazy because I don't know that much and I'm trying to do my best. So I'm thinking a lot and and I don't know about the feeling, right? I mean, maybe I'm feeling nervous or feeling this or that or whatever, but right. or maybe it's automatic, maybe less of it's automatic and more of it's, you know, I've got more notes, I'm thinking more. And then with experience, that same, exp that same class, maybe I'm thinking, thinking less or it's more intuitive right or I don't know there's other words there's other ways yeah and 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 I'm just thinking about what this means to the 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 practice you know what you know what implications this this type of discussion has on how students reflect because I agree with you that you know obviously reflection is very very important in how we do it and we need to teach and help reflect but it's like how do we reflect? Do we reflect in the moment afterwards? Do we reflect privately or publicly? Right, right. And and this this idea doesn't reach that level of openness versus closeness of of reflecting and the experience itself that I think offers another level of um, of of learning, of development, of professional development. That again, I think this idea kind of has limitations in that in that sense, but. But I, I think all of these elements I would not disagree with, you know, as far as, right, right. you know, active experimentation, of course, we want to experiment and we want to reflect and we have, we think abstractly and we think concretely, absolutely. But I think it's the how of it, the complexity and that we don't lose sight of the, the complexity of all four of these elements. Yes, yes and and I agree in the sense, sense that, that uh, it tends to be more of a psych aspect. aspect. Uh, and I'm talking about the, the idea of the way we have the teaching practicum uh, with the students at different levels. Uh, when I say that we actually go through the different stages, as you mentioned, uh, and I think you made a good example when you talked about the thinking and the feeling in the concrete experience. And uh, because, yes, so, um, uh, students themselves, and when they go through their first encounter, they prepare as much as possible, uh, and, and 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 sometimes that overwhelms uh, as, as as kind of uh, uh, happens in the first stages of of performances. The first times they perform, they perform, they are overwhelmed by their thinking. Exactly, obviously creating a feeling, and yes, and and maybe that's why I'm making uh, uh, myself the connection itself. And uh, and going a little bit further with the idea of the and this is the next part the idea of the learning styles uh, he he the, the idea is he, that he kind of makes this mixture of strengths the idea of having a little bit uh, uh, of strengths over the different um, stages let's say uh, well the stages that, that he mentions in there and. Uh, in order to be able to to um, go through the experiential learning idea, and uh, he talks about uh, this idea of accommodating, diverging, converging, and assimilating. And and then he describes a little bit uh, the idea uh, from his study about the personality that the person with this style, which would be, uh, in fact, he, he mentions later, like a uh, diverger, assimilator, accommodate, converger, and uh, accommodator. And uh, there are different char characteristics that he mentions. And, and, and if you see, uh, he is using it in this graph, well, in this, in this uh, box, the idea of uh, Combining two different stages according to the type of um, of of, a st of the style of the person. Now that's the point where I what I got kind of uh, uh, looking at the description of of the characteristics. Looking at the individual personalities of students or or pre-service teachers, 
when where they are and this goes back to what you mentioned some of, of our students uh they have certain characteristics in which they go more for being reflective and for, for being always analyzing the situation and trying to understand the situation from a mental uh point of view and some others uh they are more like practical they just want to tag along and do it and uh, they start to make in progress decisions and i think when uh, under this idea of according to their personality uh, it goes this back and forth between the different stages of uh of the students uh i don't know if uh, I, if uh I'm, i'm making my idea through about the the experiential learning he mentions Uh, well, the idea of having the converger, the diverger, the assimilator, and the accommodator is that at the end, and, and this is my opinion, is that uh, uh, it's not about being converger or being diverger. It's just uh, maybe because of inner aspects or uh, the development you had so far or your background or, or, or your proper characteristics, your character, you tend to go towards being converger, diverger, assimilator, or accommodator. But at the end, I would say all of us uh, uh, have these characteristics. But yes, we support and we go toward the supports of our strength. For example, in my case, I'm, 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 I consider myself kind of more practical in the sense. I, I, I tend to, to go through the ideas of um, uh, directly applying things as soon as possible, whether whether there's a complete plan or not, maybe. But the idea is to go through the through through the practical and, and whatever works uh, in immediate uh, more than a deeper analysis or thought or or, or research which which has these big disadvantages. Right. Uh, and that doesn't mean I don't prepare myself and that doesn't mean I don't plan. I, that does, that just means I go and, and I tend to, to go towards that idea. And if we think about the stages again, I would say in every, if, if, if we put it in that way that I have the experience, now I'm, I'm reflecting on it, now I'm having the concrete, and then I'm trying to apply it again. If you look at it that way, it, what happens is that at every single stage, I'm trying to do the application itself. It's not... Is not exclusive in that sense. Uh, I, I mean, in my experience. Yeah. Um, again, I think you're explaining this very well, and I think that um, you know my my perspective is really from the basis of that. I don't think learning styles exist. And if you go to yeah. YouTube, if you go to YouTube, there's a really good couple of videos. If you just search "learning styles don't exist," there'll be some interesting talks there. And And basically, my, my only premise here is that the learning styles, if those are going to be called converger, diverger, assimilator, and accommodator, that for me, those are just different ways of thinking. And every, every human being, depending on the situation, depending on the person, thinks, uh, you know, will have some combination of those four. Now, some may be more inclined to think certain ways than others, but... The point is this, that if we're going to link, I don't see a link from the learning styles, converger, diverger, and so on, to the experiential learning cycle. Because again, I think that in, a, in the complexity of the learning itself, because those, you know, the relationships are so quite closely uh, integrated, that really what we want is for our students to be able to think these four different ways, that they can converge sometimes, they can diverge, they can be assimilator, accommodator, depending right. on different educational environments. So it's not like I'm trying to identify each student as being one of these and then right. trying to yes. apply instruction to that. That's what I disagree with. What, I, what I'm proposing is creating an environment where students can exercise. Maybe I'm not a very good converger as a student, but I need to learn how to converge. So I need, so some of these learning quote unquote styles, really it's just a different ways of thinking. And depending on the, the task at hand, we may actually want to help some students, you know, work in this learning preference that they're not, you know, maybe they're not, uh, very proficient with and they need to learn to think a different way and 
and that that's where the support comes in and so on so so you know i the terms i like the terms that are being used in this this theoretical framework right it's just i think that the complexity and the approach of really using it and, and looking at it from a teacher trainer perspective i think it's important that we look at the complexity of of all of this and we don't lose sight of that and try to keep that in consideration, you know, take that in consideration when looking at this, um, you know, from maybe example, looking at learning styles is maybe one student is more of a diverger and then saying, okay, I'm, that's right. it. I'm just going to resign to that idea and try to. No, no, to that, to, no, no, not, not like that. Yeah. And, and, and I think you're making my point of, uh, of the example I was trying to give when I was mentioning that, uh, be, be, considering myself as more practical does not mean I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I do not plan or I do not research or I do not prepare myself from a different angle, from a, from a hypothetical, uh, I mean, pre uh, preparing myself with a hypothesis of what may happen and, and all that, you see? And, right, and but the way you sorry. put it. Yeah. Right, but, but, right, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to take that and understand what you're saying and that what you mean, but, but don't you think that the diagram that you showed where it had the learning styles in those yeah. four quadrants and they were listing the learning styles to the experiential learning don't you think that that's what's going on i mean for me I, that's for me when i look at that that last table where you have the, right. the quadrant and they have um i don't know kind what was it concrete experience was more appropriate for i don't know converger or diverger or something like that yeah let me put it but that, but for me that's misleading. Like that's, I think, the main oh, issue well, that I have, and that's different than what you just said for me. Let, personally. me, let, me, see, let me see if I get if I uh, if I get you right. Uh, you mean like uh, the way yeah, we yeah. see it in here? Yeah. Like in, in, uh, yeah, and kind of. Yeah, like this is what I'm that. saying. You're forcing. Like the way we look at it is the way we actually take it. Like What's that? that is the way we look at it. That is where that enclosed every aspect in their own in their own box. Uh, being the exclu yeah, exclusive from the others, the way we see it, it's the way it's taken to to actual uh, life, you mean? Or yeah, for me, diverging, for example. Yeah, yeah, diverging get, should, encompass, should encompass all four. Right, right. right. Assimilate, right. assimilate should be all four, and, and not necessarily one more than other. It depends on the, the right. situation. Right, I totally agree. I, 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 That's I, the problem. I Maybe I didn't uh, I, I didn't say it like that since the very beginning because this is something I've been using for long. Even even the cyclic thing, which uh, I also agree with the idea that it's not exclusive and it's not uh, as a cyclic uh, as as it looks in the right. diagram. Like yeah, I totally agree with your idea. But uh, and now that you mention it, yeah, it came to my mind. Yes, maybe that's exactly the way it's taken. We go step by step and one thing excludes the other like for example in the in the box in here like yes or you're an assimilator or accommodator no in fact uh, I, I don't see it like that and i think i read a little bit that when colf mentioned that yeah it's not about uh you being one or being the other so it's having a little bit more of tendency in or or in your development and and this and, and this is my part because of any reason because of any reason you i mean there isn't I wouldn't attach that that uh, strength. I would I would take it as my strength side, mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't say it's because of one reason. I think because in each person would be a different reason, and that's why a while ago I was mentioning your uh, your background, your development, your background in your development, uh, your your inner uh, abilities. You go through the idea of, of characters. Uh, your uh, the environment that you are in, the tutors that you've had, the idea of whoever is leading, and or, or whatever you think it's is that uh, gives you that tendency. And yes, looking at it from the way you're putting it, yeah, I totally agree. It's not a matter of uh, I cannot. Uh, uh, I'm a converging person, a converger, and that's it. And uh, and, uh, and and I'm going to struggle with the other ones. And every time I face. A different a different situation which is not suitable for me as a diverter uh, i'm gonna have i'm gonna face uh, a struggle and problems no i don't see it like that um 
I just see it as a base and 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 a starting aspect of uh, landing a little bit, uh, touching ground a little bit on the, um, uh, a general model, as as we were mentioning again, one of the models that can be uh, followed and presented so that the students can have a path when they are kind of lost. And, and, and we go back again with the path's idea. Right, and yes, right. going, be, going beyond the path with the understanding that it's not a, a, a that, that, that in this case, I wouldn't take it as a direct line to follow, right? But, and, yeah. uh, and, and uh, different conceptualizations, which at some point uh, students can go through, or you can set the situation so they can go through them and exactly develop whatever they, they, they uh, can develop individually. Right. Yeah. And again, I, I have no problem with the terminology. Some yeah. of the terminology, I think, it, I think it's just the relationships uh, between all of those that I just want us to be careful. And that's my main point, really, right. is that we look at the complexity of it and that that it, it for me, it, it, we don't look at it quite uh, in as simple terms as that it is in, in a right, right, yeah, yeah. I, I go with that. I, I agree with that. I, and 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 not now that you mentioned that, I I never took it like a, like that. Yeah, and and but my what what you made me think now is that yes, it may be taken as a strict uh, line to follow specifically in, in such right, and mm -hmm. it's like labeling students. It's like it's like it's like labeling students specifically and and condemning the students to be that way because there's a level for them. I, I, I totally agree on that. Right, and looking back at that top chart, instead of maybe a circular arrow that each arrow points to the each other. Right. Bidirectional, bidirectionally. So each influences the other in more of a complex reality. You know? Yes. That, that would be a better visual representation really of the idea that and, uh, and, and I would think also in the idea of uh, uh, macro and micro levels inside uh, of each of them. That, and that's what I mentioned, like uh, as a whole, that's what, uh, for example, in, in teaching workshop, and that's what pretty much uh, a general view of what we do in uh, you plan a class, you teach a class, afterwards, we, uh, immediately or, or in you start making a, a formal written reflection, which may start during the concrete experience, right? And then we start to discuss through uh, a, a general reflection as a group and feedback, and the teacher starts making decision and prepares himself for the next class. And that's pretty much the general view in, in teaching worship. But uh, that said, is this the same cycle goes into the idea of I'm preparing myself for the class. And, and in the preparation of the class, they go through this, uh, through the different aspects. They reflect on what they will do. They actually may experiment on, and, and maybe not, uh, not uh, physically, but in their minds actively, uh, experiment of what will happen if they decide certain structure or certain context for the structure. I mean, and that's what I mean with the micro and, 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 and macro level. Right. And, uh, and also during the reflection, we go back through the experiences. I mean, it's, it's uh, and, and that was my point at the beginning, uh, that precisely you have the different stages and, and you can look, have the view as a cycle, but uh, yes, you can, uh, we want students to get to make the quick decisions in the classroom. And, and the idea would be that, uh, that they fastly, during the, ex the, the, the experience they are having, they receive some feedback from the students as, and they have some elements to start reflecting in seconds and make decisions and take the action to experimentate. That's yeah, and, and, and taking this one step further, we talk about micro and macro, but looking at reflection again, and I talked about this earlier. Uh, sorry, can you go back to that slide? Oh, yes. If we add one more component, the open versus closed, element right we can take reflection to an, another level i mean you you've already mentioned and you are you're already doing this where you're refl you're reflecting with your students individually and also the students themselves in your group are reflecting uh, amongst themselves so imagine 
you know, that's one level of being open, right? So one level would be very, actually it would be closed. It would be just you and, and the student and then opening up to be a little bit more open with the group students and have them reflect with each other, take that another level and open it up to the whole public where possibly, potentially they could get feedback into their, they could get kind of ref, uh, feedback from their own reflection or their own experience. So this whole idea of reflection and planning or, or this experimenting and planning yeah. Go, it jumps to a whole nother level when you look at the possibilities that can occur uh, with an open learning uh, situation. I'm not saying that open is automatically better, but I'm saying that being open offers, offers it takes this whole diagram to a whole nother level. Well, yeah. And, you know, yeah. If you're gonna, as, yeah. As, as an example, look at this. There are times in which they just finished the class and... Uh, Sometimes there's no time for them to sit down and write and, and really reflect. And we tag along the, the group session, the reflective session with comments from the tutor and classmates and observers and, and their own perceptions. And so the reflective part in, the, in, in that sense, the, the open reflective part in that sense. But there are things that they already know, that they already have in their mind and, uh, and, and there's... I cannot tell you in which moment, um, if it was immediately when they did or they performed the action or whatever happened exactly, and after doing it or during doing it, uh, they immediately knew that there was something there to, that, that needed to be changed or readapt or enhanced or whatever. So when you come to the feedback, it's... They, they have it in there. They, they don't even have the words to put it in words because they haven't processed the reflection yet. I don't know if that makes a, kind of an example of this of uh, overlap of, of uh, precisely all of these stages in here. Ben, are yeah, you there? Sorry, I had my uh, mic muted. Yeah, oh, I definitely, absolutely. Like being able to provide more of an open learning situation allows the reflecting to be more closely related to the experience itself. So for example, I, I, one of the things, one of the takeaways that I got from our conversations with our pre-service English language teachers a couple of weeks ago was that they told us that over time they started becoming better at reflecting in action, right? At the beginning, right. it was more, they, they relied more on reflection on action, which happens after the event. But as they got experience and got more comfortable and started learning more, they started being able to reflect more. Now, that transition, that learning process happened, you know, that it happened in, in your case, right? It happened however it happened. But my point here is that if the students or learners are also receiving information from their experience from the very beginning, Yes. I think that also that that's going to influence how they go back and forth between reflecting in action and reflecting on action. I just think that the more it's just more input, right? It's more information that they get on their experience so that they're not just uh, learning. Uh, and this is nothing, of course, against you or one tutor, but I'm saying that that the more input that they can get, the more that they can learn to say, okay, this helps me, this doesn't help me, this, you know, and they can learn more so that they don't start to, um, that they're open to the idea of sharing their learning experience uh, with others. So when they get into the profession, they get into the field, that they have this mentality that it's okay to share, that they are, they are that they take constructive input from outside sources mm -hmm. more willingly and, and just have a better overall disposition of that of, of that way of, of learning. And, and and that's my point here is that that we, you know, it's one thing to reflect individually. Right. And it's another thing to externalize that reflection on to someone else and then yes. get feedback from someone else and then have it all almost turn into a conversation where you know the, the actual reflective process takes on a whole new level. That's my that's my main point.
Yes, in fact, uh, I kind of recall one of the techniques for uh, for reflecting in 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 pair reflection. It's precisely that uh, to to have uh, to 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 bring up whatever you have to say, uh, whether deep reflection or mere description or whatever you want to say, but have somebody to mirror exactly and 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 give you back whatever that person is interpreting from what comes from, from, from your map. So you realize about what exactly you are saying and, and, and that reinforces uh, and enhances your, your reflection itself to, to, to notice exactly what comes from the other uh, idea. Well, yes, I think we, we took uh, more time now. Interesting discussion. Uh, I kind of, uh, uh, sense something about the learning styles knowing because uh, I, I, I recall about the video we uh, somewhere along we had a talk about the learning styles video remember that yeah uh, out of the out of the out of the show so it would be interesting maybe to bring it as a topic and to see and explore that and um, and uh, yes uh, the idea the idea in here again is to put on the table different perspectives and having uh, all you viewers uh, sharing also your comments and we would love to hear what you think about this and uh, what are your, your opinions. Uh, yeah. Ben, anything else to conclude? You want to add something to this? No, just, yeah, just to uh, echo what you're saying and uh, let us know. We brought up a lot of topics and like most of our conversations, we actually come up with more topics that we want to talk about in the future. Um, but if you ever want for us to revisit a topic we've already talked about, if you want to come online and join us and have be part of the conversation, or if there's another topic that you want us to discuss, let us know and just post it in Facebook. I think that would be the, the easiest way to do that. And uh, we do uh, want to know your perspective, some of the questions that we're posing what you think about competency-based education, what you think about these learning styles and uh, experiential learning, et cetera, let us know. We want to thank everyone for watching uh, watching the, the live broadcast and also the recording. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and conclude. Biddy, thanks a lot for, for this uh, conversation as always. And uh, uh, I think we'll go ahead and sum it up. Yes, uh, thank you, Ben. I also enjoyed the talk. I I kept a lot of information from the from the links. I I I, I think we can share. The, uh, you are sharing the links in your web page, right? For for the different topics, uh, because uh, there's a lot of information. It's a, a general view of the competencies uh, based uh, uh, teaching that 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 we discussed earlier. And uh, I kind of have different, in fact, I had a lot, a lot of aspects to cover from the readings, uh, but uh, I just wanted you to handle that part and that's why I didn't get that much into it. But uh, I would recommend you all to go uh, through it because it grasps uh, 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 different angles to it. And we may revisit that maybe next week in, in that sense. Uh, I'll, we make a decision later on. And if you give us an idea of what you want to hear, that's, a be that's better for us to make our decisions. Thank you very much for the talk. I, I enjoyed and uh, I'll see you next week, right? Yes, we'll see everybody next week. Thanks for watching and take care. Yeah, keep on learning. Bye.